Um, okay, thank you so much, Suhail, for the introduction. Um, it was a, it's a pleasure to be talking today after following on from Alex Kelbert's lecture last week, uh, which in many senses serves as a kind of introduction to what I'll be talking about. I won't talk explicitly about environmental racism or climate colonialism, but basically those two issues and the conjunction between colonialism and cultivation, so the practices of cultivating the earth, exploiting the earth, uh, those are the backdrop against which I'm speaking. Um, and so rather than talk about those things explicitly, I want to continue what Alex was saying in the kind of realm of advocacy and activism here in the UK, but also in relation to the Global South, um, through the question of what various artistic practices or artworks can propose that we think about issues around voice, representation, agency, sovereignty, rights, between human rights no, uh, and non-human rights, basically as Suhail already outlined. Um, and to, so to do that, I'm going to begin with four works, or as I choose to call them, four scenes. So it'll become a bit clearer, um, perhaps, as I proceed, why I'm calling them scenes, because I want to think about sort of spaces in which artworks are presented and possible potential forums that when read together might allow us to think about different notions of agency between the human and the non-human. Um, and I also want to think about drawing from my own research this idea of agency in terms of witnessing. So thinking about the relationship between witnessing or testimony and evidence between the human and the non-human. So the four works I'm going to show, they do exist like either within the works or the works themselves exist as videos or films. For the sake of time, I'm not going to show clips because I'd have to show quite a lot. Um, so I'm just going to run through some slides. The first, first scene being uh, a particular scene from a film by Abdurrahman Sissoko from 2006 <coughs> called Bamako that I assume some of you at least might know. Um, so the film is set in a domestic courtyard in Bamako in Mali and stages a fictional court trial. Basically what's happening in the courtyard and the you have a sense um, of the, the setup, is a fictional trial against the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. So local residents, you have a judge, and you have lawyers on both sides, and local residents are coming forward, they've been called forward as witnesses to testify about the detriments of international policies in terms of finance, but in particular in terms of structural adjustment. Um, and the sort of ongoing indebtedness of the third, the, what was the third world or Africa nowadays. Um, but what's particularly striking for me in this film is one particular scene where a man called Zegwe Bamba, Bamba who's an elderly farmer and a griot, a, a sort of traditional healer, a medicinal healer, he steps forward to testify. So this is about an hour and a half into the film. Unlike the other witnesses who'd been extremely eloquent in sort of detailing the complaints against the World Bank and the IMF. He performs an oral testimony where he basically just sings. Um, and unlike in the other, throughout the rest of the film, we're given no subtitles. So the film's mainly in French. There are some bits that are in Bambara. But in this, this scene in particular, he's simply singing and we're given absolutely no idea what he's saying. So it's not translated, it's not subtitled. And it may, in fact, well be that many of the, the members of the set, the cast, didn't understand his dialect. This is something that uh, Gayatri Spivak comments upon. We're not quite sure who's understanding what. Um, so you have unable to understand what's going on or make sense of this performative intervention and unable to access the meaning of these words. During the course of this testimony come lament, the audience's attention is instead drawn to Bamba's gestures and tone and to the reactions of those around him. So you can begin to get a sense, this is the judge, and get a sense of the scene. Um, so the second scene is a work by the artist Amar Kanwa entitled The Sovereign Forest. And this has been exhibited globally since its first exhibition at Documenta 13 in 2012. And I'll just flick through some slides so you get a sense of uh, what's incorporated. So the work, which comprises several elements of various formats, 
emerges from Kanwa's lengthy engagement with conflicts between local communities, government and corporations over the control of agricultural lands, forests, rivers and mineral sources in the state of Odisha in eastern India. So one of the many um, elements is a single channel video piece entitled The Scene of Crime, which documents landscape prior to its ruination. So in this case, territories that are proposed industrial sites in the process of being acquired by the Indian government and or corporations in the Odisha recent region. So landscape here is presented as evidence or what uh, once evidence of what once was and will no longer be, or of the intertwinement between landscape and personal lives, or of a crime scene that encompasses the murder of a local activist, and what Kamwa calls, quote, a war by the state against its, uh, its own land and people. In other words, the broader crime of privatization of indigenous lands and life worlds, and what we might call the extractivist imaginary. So this is just to show some of the other elements. There's books, there's also a seed collection, just to give you a sense of the context. So this, a particular version of the Sauravirin Forest, also importantly to note, is exhibited permanently in Odisha, where it opened in August 2012. Visitors are invited to add to the growing body of evidence collected. So a selection of this archive of evidence is represented in the exhibition in, in Odisha. So it includes photographs, lists of residents, land records, tax receipts, proofs of occupancy, maps of acquired villages, documents, and a booklet of poems by a local singer called the Crazy Poet. So the third scene um, extends this notion of landscape as evidence. Um, and it's taken even further in a piece that's actually entitled Landscape as, as Evidence, Artist as Witness. So this was a staged hearing that took place at the Constitutional Club of India uh, in New Delhi in April 2017. The hearing involved theatre director and lighting designer Zuleka Chowdhury and the Koj International Artists Association from New Delhi as petitioners opposing an interstate river linking project <coughs> which included a series of dams that had recent been, recently been cleared under the Indian Commission of Inquiry Act from 1952. So the hearing created a forum for lawyers Anand Grova and Norma Alvarez, and artists Nav Navjot Alta, Ravi Agawal, and Sheba Chachi to present their cases regarding the detriment of the planned project for the public interest. British barrister Polly Higgins's proposal to include ecocide, i.e. the destruction of the natural environment, as an international crime, served as a provocation to think through the intersection of art, law, and the environment in the context of the Indian subcontinent. So throughout the hearing, the artist detailed the displacement of communities, particularly indigenous, that the hearing that the project would entail as well as the damage that it would cause to livelihoods. So running throughout was a discussion of the benefits and the pitfalls of development, depending on whose interpretation is taken into account and whose conception of value is listened to. The testimonies also evoked the legal rights of nature and detailed indigenous people's relations to or cohabitations with um, the environment around them. And moreover, unlike conventional legal forums, and this is the important part, the hearing provided a platform for the con contribution of artist petitioners who spoke of artists' capacities through their use of different media and their experimental and impressionistic approach to see not just the obvious, but also the invisible sites of trauma and the slow, often undetectable environmental violence. So this, I'm just foregrounding this notion of landscape as evidence and artist as witness. So the figure of the artist was discussed not as necessarily providing straightforward solutions, but as allowing for a slowing down of analysis in order to seek alternative strategies. And the fourth scene um, is a work entitled Forest Law from 2014 by Brazilian architect Paulo Tavares um, and 
the writer, audio, um, sorry, writer, artist, and video essayist Ursula Beeman, which was based on long-term research into the Ecuadorian Amazon as a site of conflict between the Quichua people of the Sarayaku and the oil industry. <coughs> Are you okay to just yeah, work around yeah, me? Yeah, I'll work around Okay, you. all right, cool. So I'll just, again, I'll just give you a sense of some of the elements of the installation. So the installation and the two-channel video essay therein offer a retelling of how the Quichua turned to the courts of law to make claims for the protection of the environment that they inhabit. The landmark case, Quichua indigenous people of Sarayaku versus Ecuador, in which the Sarayaku sued the state of Ecuador for facilitating oil extraction on their land, coincided with significant legal reforms in Ecuador, whereby new, a new constitution was signed in 2008 that introduced a series of the rights of nature, contending that ecosystems, so the living forest, mountains, rivers, and seas, are legal subjects. So I realize that these are all quite complex works that I'm running through quite quickly, um, but the reason I began with them is that um, I want to come back to a few of the comments that Suhail made in the introduction to last week's presentation. But before I do that, I want to just give a little bit of context in terms of voice and agency um, and the relationship between nature and race and representation. So here I draw from a 2014 article by the anthropologist Leslie Green um, and the environmental humanities scholar who identifies obstacles to the creation of what she calls an environmental public um, in the contemporary post-apartheid South Africa. So she speaks here of what she calls the political silence of creatures and landforms that we call nature. So in other words, of nature treated as a passive object, a resource without voice and without rights. So moreover, as an object that needs to be protected by humans, but importantly only by certain kinds of humans. So it's this question of who is entitled to or who ought to speak in the name of whom that I'm interested in pursuing here. So this can be addressed through um, constructive categories of active and passive and subject and object as these play out across race, nature and shifting conceptions of the human. So in the context of South Africa, for instance, Green writes that who has the right to advocate for nature is profoundly racialized, since voices raised in the protection of nature have an uneasy time escaping the scripts of race and racism. And of course, one can think about that in terms of what Alex Calvert was talking about last week in the sort of European or British context, that idea of the kind of whitewashing of the environmentalist movement and who is supposed to be included within that and who has the right to sort of take the platform and advocate for nature. So key in this, and I'm not by any means wishing to conflate the sort of specificities of the South African context and what's happening here in terms of activism, but I think it's important to think about categories of subject and object and these epistemologies that create these categories of race and nature. So key here is the subject and object relation that must be read through the legacy of colonial categorizations of forms of life. So as Green writes, quote, the violence that is racism finds its power in the classification of some as subjects who have the right to speak and others who are silent. <coughs> so the silenced are but objects or things in the racial imaginary in which people are reduced to non-humans classed as lesser species, end quote. In other words, in which some people are classed as closer to, quote unquote, nature. So Green argues for an environmentality that doesn't take recourse to these modernist categories of subject and object. It's okay. Oh, okay. Better. Um, so in other words, as I interpret it and as I'm coming to, she's arguing for an environmental public that entails 
collaboration, let's say, uh, between more than humans. And I'm using the term more than human here in the sense given by the, the anthropologist Anna Singh, who talks about sort of forms of life beyond the human. So we don't stick with human and non-human. We have a sort of distribution amongst these two categories. So what I take from Green's reading of the South African context is the need to surpass the argument around the sort of naturalization of race uh, as a social construct. So for instance, in the exotic othering of indigenous peoples whose representations from without place them closer to nature, or the rendering disposable of racialized populations merely through a cultural imaginary. So it's important to look at the way in which representations construct a cultural imaginary in which historically the quote-unquote natives were placed as closer to nature, but she's saying that's not enough. We need to actually take a step back. We need to reconsider the modernist imaginary that constructs these two different categories of subject and object. Um, so in, instead, she's suggesting addressing both race and nature concomitantly in the modernist imaginary, precisely through the manner in which the subject and object divide allows us to think through both racism and the war on nature. This sounds really odd, but you're okay with it? Kind of tinny. Yeah. Okay, so coming back to the, the four scenes that I began with here, I'm picking up on uh, Suhail's introduction, where he, um, he spoke about the way in which art tends to, at least, uh, revolve around an individual subject, an individual artist who's making claims, speaking in their own name. Um, and in my reading here, I want to think about not specifically the figure of the artist, but the figure of the individual witness. So the artist might well be a witness, or they might be making works about witnessing, like the film Bamako, where we see problematized you know, the way in which witnessing can and can't function. Um, but I want to go beyond this individual figure. So for instance, in Bamako, we're given an example of the kind of inherent possibility of testimony not functioning, the inherent untranslatability of testimony through this individual figure. Um, and I'm drawing from the reading of the post-colonial critic Stephen Morton, who says that this scene is exemplary insofar as it basically highlights the challenges of finding an appropriate voice or appropriate language through which to contest the policies of organizations like the World Bank or the IMF. Um, but it's also drawing attention to the limitations of the dominant institutions of civil society, for instance, the legal realm, so the court symbolizing a dominant institution. Um, and it's raising questions about the limitations of people from the global south, whether we choose to call them subaltern or not, um, for basically voicing their complaints about being disenfranchised, being disempowered. So my proposal is that even though this film, Bamako, doesn't talk about environmental issues, we have to be reading environmental issues against the backdrop of the economic policies of the IMF, of the World Bank, thinking about what uh, Alex Calvert was talking about last week in terms of the necessity for a global Green New Deal and this necessity for uh, reparations in order for these implementations to be carried out, environmental um, policies to be carried out on a global scale. So what I propose is that we think, we take up this challenge posed by Bamba about how would one find an adequate voice and what would be an adequate forum in which to voice one's complaints insofar as these complaints entail the destruction of the environment as well as the destruction of state services like education, healthcare, so on and so forth, transport. Um, so, Another thing that uh, Suhail spoke of was, was the risk of limiting critique and de demands to the individual and the necessity, as already uh, outlined by Suhail, of thinking about systemic causes um, of the issues such as climate change, uh, climate chaos. Um, so again, thinking about this in terms of witnessing, I want to make two main claims. So if there are two main claims you come away with, this is it. So first of all, that the figure of the witness can no longer be an individual. So we move from the individual witness figure to witnessing constellations or witnessing collectivities. And as such, such witnessing constellations 
need to take heed of discrimination along lines of race in particular, i.e. along the lines of who is allowed to speak, whose voice is given amplification, as I was already talking about. And then the second point is that although the figure of the witness has at least traditionally been confined to the human, what is needed is witness collectivities that open up beyond the category of the human into what we might call more than human witnessing constellations. Um, and this is where I'll come back to some, some artworks. So what is the status of nature as witness? Um, and what maybe do the works that I began with tell us about this? So there are many works, be they from visual arts or literature or poetry, that, that propose that we think about nature as archive. So for instance, we recall Camois' scene of the crime, or scene of crime, uh, in proposing that nature and landscape be viewed as evidence. And also the coach staged hearing that talks about landscape as evidence. Um, and in the case of forest law, the violent history of colonization and extractive capitalism is addressed through what the artists call the earthly memory of the soil of the Ecuadorian Amazon. So in this case, this is not at all a metaphor. As you see in the image, there are scientists carrying out tests um, and engaging in forensic analysis of the soil and the sort of toxicity of the soil caused by oil companies. And there are other examples of artworks that talk about soil as a kind of archive. So one would be this film, Mind Soil, by Philippe César, which quotes the Guinean agron agronomist and liberation leader, Amilcar Cabral, in speaking of soil as, quote, a natural, independent, and historical body. And speaking of the destroyed soil in contemporary Portugal as, quote, an open wound on the Earth's body, on the social past. So here the film functions as a, as a form of kind of mining of the surface or bringing back the sediments of the past. And I show this image also because I think it's quite powerful in terms of this notion of ventriloquism that I'll be coming to. So you have the landscape and you have the technological apparatus that's somehow trying to amplify, in a sense, the quote-unquote speech of landscape. And then you have the figure of the witness, of the artist as witness, in a sense, who's further amplifying this. Um, there are many other examples. Oh, this, there's an, also there's an article by César about this work and about Cabral um, as an agronomist, so a soil scientist, prior to being liberation leader, um, which is in the third text issue that Suhail already mentioned. So this is, you see in many artworks, the idea of landscape as evidence or as archive. But what about moving from this kind of idea of a passive archive or a passive repository to an active witness. So again, artworks are useful. We can think about someone like Maria Teresa Alves's work, Seeds of Change, which basically does a kind of archaeology of botany. She's tracing seeds that have been used as ballast on ships to help weigh them down, and she's tracing them around the world. So in a sense, you can do, you can sort of uncover trajectories of migration through the kinds of plants that are growing in certain cities. And I show this work because, I mean, there's lots of research that goes into it, lots of mapping out, but because the late critic Jean Fisher spoke in, of this work into a, sort of in, including seeds as what she calls migration silent witnesses. So thinking about seeds themselves as witnesses to migration, to movement, particularly in the absence of human survivors. So we can look at historical flows. We might think of the slave trade, for instance, the movement of goods. So where there is no human witness left to tell the tale, we can turn to the seeds. There's also the work of Oriol Olof, Teatrum Botanicum, which looks at plants and politics in South Africa. And he himself speaks of nature as a kind of active participant in or a sort of witness to historical events. So there's a series of works, photographs called The Memory of Trees, for instance, which portrays trees that were important either during apartheid or during anti-apartheid struggles, so as landmarks close to people's uh, hideouts or as meeting points, so on and so forth. Um, but my question is, 
It's all very well if artworks talk about nature as a witness metaphorically, but what does it mean for nature to be a witness quite literally? Um, so coming back to the works that I began with, so in both the Kanwa work and the Koch staged hearing, as I already mentioned, landscape is presented as evidence, with the artist's role being that of the witness. So the artist's role is that of a kind of animator or a ventriloquist, as in the César still, or we might even say as a privileged translator. But what of nature itself as witness? So in landscape as evidence, or artist as witness, the various artists slash witnesses speak of the necessity to move beyond the perspective of mere humans and to include the perspectives of nature as that which has uh, been excluded from, or traditionally at least, in the modernist imaginary from human culture. And to include these perspectives in the deliberations of public interest. So in forest law, however, this goes even further. So the work cites the notion of cosmopolitics as a new constitutional space wherein humans and non-humans gather in a political assembly. In this case, the forest, the living forests of the Amazonia. So what is stressed here is nature's agency and its status, both as the bearer of rights and as a political actor. So referencing Amerindian thinking, so for instance in the work of philosopher Deborah Danowski and anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro, this forest court, as the title goes, calls for the constitution, and I'm quoting here from the artist, the constitution of a universalist, multi-species politics beyond the human. So a space of the social that encompasses both humans and non-humans, people and nature, in which every object is also a political subject. Sorry, I'm really losing my voice. So obviously this is quite different to the South African context that I evoked uh, previously. So it's precisely the constitution writers of Ecuador and Bolivia who Green turns to in her examination of South Africa and in her attempt to bring the South African post-apartheid experiment into conversation with Latin American decoloniality. By including nature as bearer of legal rights in 2008, the, constitutions, the constitution writers of Ecuador and Bolivia and Poison Green have extended their critique of modernist thought to reject the subject-object divide <clears throat> that legitimates a war on nature. And they're attempting to constitute an environmentality that draws on a different intellectual heritage. So here we can think of this subject-object divide that legitimates not only a war on nature, but also legitimates, historically at least, colonial racism and genocide. So for Green, such decolonial thinking, as well as the post-humanities, can be mobilized to inform environmental management and conservation science. Epistemologically and ontologically, modernity, as underpinned by coloniality, generates and continues to generate categories of race and nature through precisely its conception of subjects and objects. So I'm quoting Green here. The nature-culture divide is one of the founding dualisms of modernist thought, and it's grounded in the divis division of subjects from objects. Crucially, the collision of nature and object finds its outworking in racism, for race reduces people to objects via the language of biology and species. Racism naturalizes the idea of race and turns it into nature." End quote. So moving from nature as a potential political actor, as we saw in the case of forest law, I want to think about this more specifically as a witness figure. So here we can turn, there are many examples we can draw from, one being the work of forensic architecture, which I'm sure at least some of you know is based here at Goldsmiths. Um, they have an array of different investigations, but basically the sort of one of the founding tenets of the project is to take leave from the kind of fallibility or vulnerability of the human witness, or in many cases the absence of the human witness. 
So instead, I mean, it's not to say to dismiss witnessing and human testimony entirely, or rather to corroborate it, to supplement it, sometimes to sort of supplant it where there is no human witness. Um, but basically what they propose is this idea of forensic aesthetics, whereby matter becomes a sensor and kind of can function as kind of a register of environmental, of, sorry, of violent uh, acts that take place upon it. So this matter could be human or non-human, but in many cases it is actually the natural environment. So this is just a few examples of work they've done uh, that engage with the environment, and in many cases engage with sort of ongoing forms of colonialism, or the kind of coloniality that I was already speaking about. So there's here in Argentina, there's in Gaza, looking at the use of herbicidal warfare. Um, there's... Also in uh, Indonesia, a project about ecocide in the forests. Uh, and in Guatemala, looking at the genocide that was carried about um, against indigenous peoples in the Ixil Triangle. So that's one example. Um, just importantly to mention that, so going back to that figure of the ventriloquist, the sort of artist as ventriloquist that I mentioned before, forensic architecture sort of proposes that we think about objects as witnesses. Um, most of the time to question the factual reality that's expressed by the state and in, sort of in human rights violations, investigations. But they talk about this idea of forensic speech or the kind of mediated speech of inanimate objects as, and we can think about this as a kind of form of ventriloquism. So objects are animated, referred to as if they were human subjects even if those who do the animating um, are not simply humans, but could be technologies of detection and imaging. So another notable example would be the work of artist and theorist Susan Shipley, who teaches here and actually runs the Center for Research Architecture. And since 2005, Shipley's been developing this kind of, what she calls a kind of operative concept of the um, material witness. So, this, for instance, is the archives of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And what she does is she thinks about, the, uh, again, the kind of expressive qualities of materials, in particular forms of media, looking at the way in which the way that evidence is registered through certain media actually bears witness to the way in which evidence is considered and the way in which evidence moves its way through certain institutions. So she's foregrounding what she calls the expressive quality of non-human matter. In this case, it's media objects, so they're not living objects, but I'll come back to some other work of, of Shukli's, which engages with the environmental. Um, so this idea of the expressive quality of non-human matter sort of suggests that there is a possibility, be it living matter in, the, in what I'm interested in, of nature potentially acting as its own witness. Um, but a classic post-colonial conundrum arises at this point. So in conceiving of more than human witnessing collectivities, a question arises, that of representation as proxy or as speaking for. So in seeking to represent or to advocate for nature, do we, i.e., quote unquote, certain human subjects, do we not run the risk of reproducing modes of silencing or erasure, be this of the subaltern subject or indeed of nature, that we seek to overturn? So here I draw from the feminist theorist Astrida Naimanis, who proposes that nature might in fact be understood in a sense as another form of subaltern and that following Gayatri Spivak's classic essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? We might just inadvertently be silencing or mishearing the subaltern, despite well-intentioned attempts to let him, her, or it speak. That said, nature does, in fact, represent itself. So we know for a start that nature, for instance, vegetal life, plants, trees, has highly complex means of communication. But how then are we to read, or to respond to, or even amplify such representations? And how are we to do this without silencing it? 
So here again, we can turn to the work of Shupli. Oh yeah, this is just a classic example. We couldn't help. You have uh, various Hollywood stars personifying or anthropomorphizing nature. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how are we to not do this? Obviously, there's the question of the rights of nature and the kind of legal standing of nature, something we can maybe talk about later on. I mean, of course, it's wonderful that in certain places around the world, nature is given the sort of uh, status as a legal person, but of course, it still means that humans are speaking on behalf of nature. Humans are just designated kind of caretakers of a river or a mountain, for instance. What I'm more interested in is how do we actually listen to the communication of nature and translate that without somehow imposing our own um, interpretation or motivations on it. So here again, I turn to the work of Susan Shupli. This is actually an image of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill from 2010 that many of you are perhaps familiar with. And it's a series of images that Shupli has reworked into a project called Slick Images, the Photogenic Politics of Oil. This is something that Shupli spoke about in the Visual Cultures public lecture series a couple of weeks ago. Maybe some people were there. This idea of she has another series called Nature Represents Itself. So she was basically looking at the available images. Basically, when the oil spill started to take, take place, the enormity was so grave that actually there was an image ban. So you have some images that are available like this. And then you have satellite imagery. Um, she was able to get hold of some underground war video footage of the, the oil spill. But what she ended up doing was collating the work of a group called Public Lab, who basically, in a sense, through a kind of uh, crowdsourcing uh, operation or a sort of citizen science operation, collated themselves, collated satellite imagery that it was existing. And she, and then plotted it together. So this, what looks like a really abstract image, is in fact a composition of satellite imagery. But what she then did is made a kind of re-rendering of the oil slick itself. It's a little bit complicated, so I'll read it out. Um, but basically what works like slick images or nature represents itself show is that environments themselves are expressive. So continuing from that nature, that notion of kind of matter as expressive that we saw in forensic aesthetics and we saw in uh, Shublu's material witness, she's showing how polluted environments in particular, so for instance, polluted yeah, oil slicks, contain vast photosens photosensitive surfaces that register and record the changes caused by modern industrialization. So this can be mobilized by the practice of forensis, in which certain such traces are read, quote unquote, and narrated by the expert, or indeed the non-expert, as we see in, in this image, the, the public lab image, um, narrated by the witness in the quest for accountability and exposure. So in this work here, she's analyzing the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and arguing through artworks and accompanying commentary that the oil slick itself, beyond the external image, i.e. beyond representations of the oil spill, quote, operationalized an independent mode of cinema as what she names a slick image. So for Shupli, the cinematic capacity of the oil spill is a feature of its very ontology, its molecular structure and behavior. As such, the oil slick can be understood as engaged in what she calls the, protection, the production of a new form of cinema, organized by the found footage of nature itself. So the conditions that brought about the disaster are thus re-expressed as an ontological rearrangement of molecular matter. A shift from the representation of the damaged drilling rig and its gushing crude oil to the actualization of what she calls a ruinous image. So, and I think I'll just kind of wrap up here. So what I think is useful in a work like this is that uh, you have, in a sense, you still have the figure of the human witness who is recording these images. 
But as Shukri herself would say, that this image is perhaps going or perhaps working towards the call by certain writers, certain activists, to produce new forms of narratives or new forms of storytelling or new forms of bearing witness that somehow register and bear witness to these forms of what someone like Rob Nixon would call, call slow violence. So forms of violence that don't register in spectacular events. So toxicity, for instance, pollution, dispossession in various levels. And she's saying that perhaps one response to this would be to form these kind of nature culture assemblages, whereby you still have the human witness who's reading these ruinous images, but you have nature producing a kind of image for itself. So of course this isn't to say that nature is literally getting up into the courtroom and speaking, but nature is expressing itself in a way and you have a kind of symbiotic relationship between the human and the non-human in producing these kind of ruinous images. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there and we can discuss. All right. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have to do it shouty. Um, apologies again for the technical issues. It's kind of taken everyone by surprise. Um, so I'll I'll kind of ask a question, sort of recapping yeah. some of what I understood the talk to be, um, and then uh, it's, it's kind. Of, I mean, this, it's it's such a rich talk. It's quite hard to sort of find a angle in it. But you kind of it seemed to me that you were going through various stages of. Um, how, how do we how do we understand um, how to engage with nature or like how it might speak or testify mm -hmm. uh, within within a process that we then have to take into account um, and at the beginning it's it sort of seemed that you were saying I think you said at one point that the artist acts as a mediator or translator yeah or, or uh, a ventriloquist or ventriloquist yeah. um, and then uh, um, and there, the artist, in a way, pays attention to what's happening in the natural process and tries to represent that and represent that yeah. in ways that make sense to human agency as a site mm -hmm. of intervention. Uh, and maybe my second question will be about mm -hmm. that, that moment. Um, and then in, towards the end, when you're talking about Susan, Susan's work, mm. um, it was in a way to have the artist kind of dissolve almost yeah, in, in favour of... Yeah what nature itself might be doing. Yeah, yeah. So it's a kind of vanishing mediator yeah, in, a sense, in, yeah. in, in the process. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering, uh, and you alluded to it right at the end, um, we still need nature to make sense, to intervene within like, human, human processes, such as law, yeah. uh, litigation. So for example, if you want to take litigation against yeah. oil companies, yeah. somehow the oil company needs to understand that this film... Yeah. which is nature representing itself, matters to the oil company. Yeah. Um, so you need them to change their understanding of what counts as yeah. valid speech. Um, but you're saying it's not the artist who t takes that role, right? So I'm wondering kind well, of how, how, how does, just, just to yeah, finish this, yeah, yeah. this part of the question, how, how would, uh, say, a non-artistic agency yeah. understand something like Susan Shipley's film to be... How would they accept that this is nature yeah, yeah, yeah. making a demand on it, and they go? I'm not sure how, as sort of someone in, let's say, the world beyond art, or let's say a lawyer would understand, mm. would use what Susan presented. I'm not sure they could use it as evidence because you have the 
you have the existing images that do and don't exist, like the satellite images or the images from underwater. Um, I think that the work is trying to, this is why I'm sort of presenting it in relation to these other works, that it's somehow contributing to... For instance, in the, if we read it in light of the, the coach piece, the Indian piece, the artist's landscape is evidence, artist's witness, you have what the artists are presenting there is the way in which nature functions in relation to the life worlds of the mm. people around them. So they're trying to, what they're trying to do is to publicly say back to the law, like you the Indian law or you the law in many regions of the world where extractivism is taking place, in many places the law does have the sort of colonial origins or the colonial roots of law are still very evident. So the artist is trying to say, like, the legal framework is still insufficient for thinking about the sort of ecological, more relational conception of whereby there isn't this category of subject and object or the sort of the blurring of the boundaries of nature and culture. Um, and so, and to not think in the typical extractivist terms, in terms of value, whereupon nature is this object to be consumed. So I think a work like Shupli's is trying to say, like, nature does have this capacity of representing itself, um, but it's not like it could just do that on its own. You still need the artist to mm. mediate within it. Um, but it's one step towards sort of contributing to a sort of disavowal or a disregard of thinking about nature <coughs> simply as this passive object. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, so as a, as a kind of supplementary, it's, I mean, one, one way... I think com more commonly, maybe outside of the art field, when it's our nature to be representing itself is through climate, climate chaos, yeah. uh, climate crisis, where there's a sense in which um, na nature is impacting on human structures, human stability, yeah. uh, meaning making, material yeah. infrastructures, and the rest of it. It doesn't really need a mediator to yeah, exactly. help us think that out, apart from we understand it to be part of an interconnected system because of yeah. quite sophisticated technological re representations like satellite images yeah. and so on so there's a sense in I guess I guess I'm asking something about the role of the image yeah. in this so we can understand um, say climate crisis because of weather conditions changing in our lifetimes yeah, yeah. Um, because of droughts because of desertification yeah, yeah. flooding and the rest of it um, you, you don't necessarily need the you don't necessarily need the the film produced in a way, the, in the, like this quite sophisticated yeah. uh, sort of production of, of the Oslik as film, for example. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's all about, it's also the question of register and scale in terms of eventfulness. This is why I sort of mentioned the Rob Nixon work where he's talking about, you know, you have right. spectacular violence, you have structural violence such as racism or systemic inequalities. You have what he calls slow violence as well, which is often imperceptible. So that's what escapes like these big you know you can think of the documentaries in which we see hurricanes and we see floods and we have all these really bombastic images of nature really making itself felt so we don't need like fucking <coughs> phoenix and all these superstars to be taking on the voice of nature it's you're right it's already speaking but the point is that you know yes that's happening but on the other hand there are these more slower processes of, of sort of environmental violence that are taking place which include the kind of, if we go back to the Latin American decolonial movement, for instance, we can think about the coloniality of power, of being, of knowledge. Like these slower forms, one can think about through sort of a, a decoloniality, a decolonization of epistemology, let's say. Those are the forms that don't necessarily register in these big images. So I think a work such as Shipley's mm -hmm. is somehow undoing, it's somehow working on that level as well. I mean, it's, I've been reading it through, and I'm not quite sure where to take it yet, but the, the classic Spivak essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? She's talking about two senses of representation. So you have the aesthetic, <coughs> and then you have the political. So the political in terms of standing in as a proxy, a representative, and then there's the aesthetic. And in this sense, you know, nature, it's aesthetically representing itself, but it's also been granted through universal jurisdiction uh, legal standing. So that court, that case, the the oil spill, 
it was actually taken through the process of universal jurisdiction to the courts in Ecuador, mm. and a case was carried out, and this is something that Paolo Tavares talks about, mm. a case was carried out or presented in the defense of the rights of nature, so in the defense of the sea. So in a sense, I mean, of course they didn't win, but it was you know, an exemplary case in a sense, that nature was there, the sea was there given political representation as well as having its own aesthetic representation. Shupli's work was made after the fact, but I think it's somehow contributing to a conversation saying that perhaps nature can have both, um, although the political representation always does involve a human standing in and sort of pleading its case, let's say, in the legal forum. Right. I've got one more question before I open it to, to Q&A. Um, so, uh, I mean, it seems to me like what you're showing is one of the many ways in which art does a lot of really great work because the, the thought that um, the plant might be a legal, valid, a valid legal subject mm. uh, and have voice equal to the voice of the standard human actors or the corporation. Yeah. But equally, in American law, we know the corporation's a person. Yeah. So you already have some sense of yeah, yeah. non-human personhood yeah, yeah. there, which you're saying, oh, yeah, through the work you're, you're, you're drawing attention to, is now being extended yeah. more generally. Um, so in a way, what, what art does is kind of expand the field of personhood to non-human actors. Ish? I think it asks us to think about that. All right. Yeah, okay. and that's where I began with those those sort of forums, because I think they're spaces that like you have the legal forum in Bamako, which is already, it's not, there is no legal forum in which you can put the IMF and the World Bank on trial, obviously. Uh, but it's, so it's a kind of speculative or a propositional space in which that's fictionalized, it's dramatized. And we see the failures of that. But it's at the same time, that's the chance of testimony for it to also retain something somehow untranslatable within it. And then you move to the, the um, sovereign forest space where you have evidence presented in this art space, exhibition space, but it's also presented in the local region in India as a space for collecting more evidence, so a discursive space. Uh, so it's really more of an activist space when it's in India rather than when it's in Documenta, where it's in that art forum, that context, it's thinking about issues of whether poetry could be introduced into the legal forum. That's a proposition that Kamala himself makes. But it's getting us to begin thinking about the role of landscape as evidence. It's not suggesting necessarily that landscape has agency in, legal, in a legal sense. I mean, there's one moment where he talks about the, like, the river being its own, its own, need, own witness to itself. Um, but then if we move through to the um, the coach piece, at that point you get more of a sense of landscape or nature having its own agency and then through to the forest law where nature is treated as a political actor. So I think these works in sort of mm -hmm. between them, they're trying to complicate what does it mean to think of evidence in relation to testimony, who gets to have that, who gets to occupy that space between the human and the non-human. I'm not saying that necessarily art itself is how did you put it? Granting personhood. Granting per okay. personhood. But I right. think art allows us to think through these sort of minutiae of representation that then we can think, okay, how would that work in the legal realm or how would it work in the public realm? Yeah. Well, I think, so, so what I was heading towards, and this will really be the final yeah. question, um, is, is what, what was quite interesting for me and in the work you're showing is how um, the art, art or the artists or artists um, play a role connecting the natural object and violence on nature yeah. um, to other fora and other institutions like law, yeah. like yeah, media, yeah. Uh, med medical sort of health processes yeah, and so yeah. on. Um, and, and insofar as it's the art field is, is part of a mediating structure, yeah. but also in the service of violences yeah, to kind sure. of rectify violences yeah, against yeah. nature or to redress them. Um, the kind of very basic claim about Western art systems, which is that they're autonomous, yeah. has to be given up. Yeah, right? sure. So yeah, yeah. The, there's a kind of, in, insofar <coughs> as you have art in the service of another claim, yeah. which is in some ways quite an extraordinary claim, according to subject-object about you're talking yeah. about, we just have to <coughs> abandon 
sort of fairly <coughs> deep rooted in conventional notions of the autonomous artwork and yeah, the autonomous yeah, artist, totally, yeah. and also autonomous of art as an institutional structure, autonomous against other forms of social yeah. reproduction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I completely agree. Great, yeah. that's a good answer. Yeah, yeah. Good. But that's, that's also, I mean, I that's another reason because I hesitated to include the the Canwa work just because you know I'm just narrating all these and yet another scene, and I think that one's really important. That I mean, someone like Emma Canwa functions as an artist on the global art circuit, and yet this struggle that he's documenting um, around the sort of land claims of the forest and indigenous lands. He'd been following that for, I think, at least 10 years before he even dared to consider making an artwork mm -hmm. about it. And it's very much rooted in an activist practice. I'm not saying that's just like an easy way out of criticisms of the art world and its sort of relation to super problematic inst in, uh, institutions, but I think if we're thinking about a, a work that's engaging with extractivist practices as that work does, we can't not think about the extractive, mm. extractivist processes of the production of art, right? And that's one work that I've been thinking, okay, but at least for a long term, he's, for a long time he's been engaged in activism against that kind of resource extractivism and the extractivism of, of local knowledges and so on and so forth. So I think that's one, one quite exemplary project, whereas other projects I think we'd be quite push to excuse them, let's say. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Okay, there's, uh, I'm gonna take a question there. There's no mic, so you just have to shout it out, and then there's a question for Michael. So, um, you were saying, thanks, first of all, for a very interesting talk. Um, you're saying you're interested in uh, not imposing your own interpretation, uh, but, doesn't uh, hermeneutics only take place via the subject? Um, the ideas of damage or justice, or like I said, like a ruinous image, yeah. only exists via humanistic subject. And um, these values, don't they not already pre-exist in nature in itself? Uh, and on that point, it doesn't uh, particularly uh, the role of ideology sort of lose its value in in this presentation of an objectivity like in the same way that you said that Susan's work uh, shows the way that a media can express itself isn't that uh, show the transformative value of uh, media in a non-objective way yeah I completely agree against objectivity um <coughs> Of course, the, I mean, as you were saying, the one doing the interpreting, their claims are always going to be subjective, and they're often strategic in a very useful way. I mean, you can think of the work of forensic architecture that might narrate evidence in one context in one way and in a slightly different way in another, you know, between a legal context or an activist context. That evidence, you know, evidence doesn't speak for itself. It has to be narrated. And so that will shift according to who you're speaking to. So I completely agree with that. What I meant was just to, uh, to avoid this sort of reconstruction of, if one's fighting against, let's say, the extractivist imaginary, or one's fighting against an oil company or a big mining corporation, you don't want to be just very simply making claims about needing to protect nature in the register of, rage, of nature itself just being a passive object. So you, it could be like, don't come and mine this region because it's ours, right? It's our property um, and it's something that we want to profit from. So I'm saying that there are certain kinds of speech or advocacy in the name of nature that are just reproducing that which they're seeking to contest. Does that make sense? Yeah. But of course there's no objectivity. Yeah. The, can, I'll take this question and come back to yours. That was a really great uh, talk, Shayla. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is really following from perhaps what you just said now, um, is the relationship between evidence and testimony. Hmm. Because in the conventional sense, there's a sort of discrepancy between evidence and testimony. So that... Um, unreliable witness, say, can still be valid as testament <coughs> for a case in, in trials involving traumatic things, yeah. Holocaust trials. Yeah. 
may not remember things correctly. Yeah. It's still valid testimony. Yeah. Um, now, I guess my question is, to what extent does the relationship, in a conventional sense, depend on the subject-object ontology? And what happens to that relationship when you want to get away from a subject-object ontology? Does the relation between evidence and testimony change? I mean, some of the things you said, you, I mean, you're saying, in a sense, you know, the evidence doesn't speak for itself, but at mm. the same time, pushing testimony in the direction of nature so that mm. it's nature that testifies in some way, or yeah. objects that, that testify. And the move away, that seems to depend on the move away from a subject object ontology. So I'm really wondering what the implications of that might be, and also what the implications of that might be for the relationship, for example, to uh, science. You know, when, when there's the demand to listen to the scientists on climate yeah. change, yeah. arguably that science still depends on the subject object ontology at some level. So what is the relationship there between evidence testimony mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure I can't think of examples, but um, there are, of course, like this sort of strategic camouflage and so on and so forth within nature. Yeah, of course. Um, Michael, thank you. Um, of course, I mean, the, the work of forensic architecture, for instance, is taking leave from that kind of unreliable witness, you know, the classic, you know, Holocaust uh, trials where the witness comes forth and because of trauma can't speak, you know, be they fainting or otherwise, that, you know, in some testimony theory would be bearing witness precisely to the impossibility of testimony or to the gravity of the situation. So it's still witness, as you say, of course, yeah. Um, I guess what I probably didn't make clear enough is that unlike you know, many people who are looking at the rights of nature or who are looking at just material and its agency, sort of new materialists, I'm not so pro just thinking about nature itself as witness. I think it has to be. That's why I was stressing the witnessing constellation. So I'm not saying, like, just talk about nature as witness. I think you have to, there are human, non-human assemblages of witnessing, whereby there is, of course, there's a movement of communication or registration between humans and non-humans. So I think that's how I would like to see, like, maintaining that, that blurring of the subject-object divide. Um, so I'm not sure one has to follow what you were suggesting, which I think makes sense if you think about simply nature as witness then that would force us to reconsider the subject object. But I'm saying, no, let's somehow keep that movement between the two in terms of this sort of more than human sensing. Yeah. Um, the scientific imaginary, how would you respond to that? We have other questions. Okay. Can, we, can we maybe take yeah. Well, maybe why people don't listen to no. science. Okay. Because <laughs> the problem is the lack of imaginary where there is a different set of relationships that are not simply subject-object relationships or something like that. I'm going to move we'll on because I, I don't want to. I don't, yeah. don't want to have too much like conversational back and forth because okay. it's a it's a kind of public forum. So it's a question over there and the question here. Let me take that one first. Where? This yes, there, so the I green check. Oh, sure. could, um, could an analogy be drawn maybe between what you were talking about with nature representing itself and the idea of the river being a witness to itself and something like um, Haroon Baraki's operational images mm. and this idea of 
uh, machines starting to be able to see for themselves or kind of making images that do something yeah. insofar as they like activate other images. And I mean, I think part of his implication was that that almost cuts out the, the human yeah. interpreter, whether or not that's really true in terms of the, the machine. Yeah. But I just wondered if there's some kind of uh, analogy there that could be drawn as an operational image where nature <coughs> making an image for other aspects of the I nature. guess, because I mean, you have. I'm thinking of the work of someone like Jennifer Gabris here, who was at Goldsmiths and who's moved to Cambridge. Has she? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good. She's right. chair of some part of the sociology department. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and she has, now I forget the name of the project, but you have... Um, a Citizen pop- Sense, right? No, no, so yeah, Citizen Sense. But she has within that, or she had these projects that were monitoring, I mean, there's like moss cameras and there's cameras that are monitoring, I forget if there's birds as well, it could just be moss. And moss registers pollution, lichens register pollution. So you have, I forget whether she actually has like automated image making uh, technologies being used there, but I think there are other examples, maybe that one, where you have a sort of operational image that you're talking about, so a machine that produces an image in and of itself without human mediation, which is also producing an image of nature, which then gets translated by the human. And I think that's something that's something that Shupli hints towards when she's talking about this kind of assemblage of nature culture that you could have all three working together rather than having like the the technolo- like the satellite image that's really from afar that's capturing nature in an automated sense. This is much more sort of localized, but it's of course, yeah, it would be wrong to it would be wrong to draw that distinction between nature and technology in the first place. So I'm not saying we need a really pure image, like we need to literally be present to a river representing itself in a, in some sense. No, not at all. If there can be useful forms of of, of image-making technologies that can be used to then somehow translate that, then great. Um, but I think the question of power is also important within that. You know, those operational images, some of them carry out violent effects. Um, other ones are just more mechanical in terms of procedural. You know, I'm thinking of like in satellites when the docking, you know, you've got the camera that's guiding the part towards it and then it's just docking. Um, so we need to think about in what context are those images being used and where are the power relations and how is it being used by a human subjects. Does that make sense a bit? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was, I was also imagining we were just, just using it as an analogy rather than bringing technology into okay, it. Yeah. Like, are there, are there any, could there be any cases where an image of something in nature actually has agency to activate some other natural process? Well, I mean, you can think of flowers and, like, yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah. yeah. Attracting a, pollinators and yeah. Yeah, there's a very good essay by Roger Kawa, uh, legendary psychosthenesia, <laughs> oh, yeah. where he's talking about um, insect mimicry. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. And that's where insects are producing images of themselves as leaves, but then they start eating their own species because mm. they're leaf-eating insects. <laughs> it's it's really good. Um, <laughs> so it, it seems camouflage is is a, is a way that that happens, I imagine, but. It seems a broader question about yeah. the, the, the certain amount of kind of intervening. Yeah. Do you have a question as well? You can take this one. I was actually going to ask something quite similar, but I was going to say we talked about like mediation, um, that which is done by humans and the mediated yeah. being nature. And then, but we came to forensic architecture and then we started speaking about um, the mediation tech provided by technology as well. Yeah. And, um, Coming back to the human, non-human, you did say it's not nice now to bring up this idea of the dichotomy between nature and uh, technology, but I had a sense that when you said non-human, you were always mostly referring to nature. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah, it's true. And yeah. I'm trying to think about perhaps bringing in this notion of double photography, mm-hmm. when we speak of the uh, matter being a sensor. Yeah. And I'm aware that sometimes in forensic architecture, they speak of it as a process of double photography, yeah. where the sensitive surface of matter yeah. is a photograph in itself, and the uh, like image information itself and yeah. the photograph of it, which circulates through these different technologies, is a second kind of still sensing surface. Yeah. So we can read both, so the relationships get m- much more complicated. Yeah, yeah. So I perhaps want you to just maybe 
respond to the question of technology. Yeah, yeah. Very similar. Yeah, no, you're right. When I was talking about non-humans, I was referring mm -hmm. mainly to nature, but I guess the footnote was that that nature is never not technologized in some way. Um, so, and that was the point of talking about, you know, you can talk about matter, it could be buildings, walls, whatever, as a register or a sensor. Um, but you're right, like the work of like A.L. Weisman's re reading of uh, Fuzzle Sheikh's aerial imagery in the Nakab, you know, he's talking about earth images. So he talks about the surface of the desert, not as, it's, of course it's not a photograph, but it has the same form in terms of the same sort of registering techniques as the photograph. And then you've got the photographs of that earth image, which is very similar to what Susan Shipley is pr proposing with the, these slick images, but in a differ different molecular arrangement, let's say. Um, but no, I wasn't intending to exclude. I think if the, if the technological and sort of image-making machines can be used in that, within that in a productive way, then brilliant, of course. Because it would be really, I mean, that would just be going back to that kind of modernist imaginary that we're trying to get rid of, to say you've got nature and technology separate. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we've, we've used the word, or I've heard it in the questions as well, interpretation. Yeah. Um, and I just want to pick your brain about that a little bit, and how you understand the role of interpretation within witnessing, mm. um, and how that might um, relate to the idea of the, the material witness. Mm. Um, is it different from registration or sensing? Like what, what is the... I mean, yeah. I'm just going to paraphrase. So the question, if you didn't hear it at the yeah. back, was about um, the word interpretation came up a lot. And Kristen was wondering about the role of that word in relationship to witnessing, material witnessing. Yeah. Uh, cause, yeah. It seems to do something different than like registration. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is also my quandary in using the word representation. That implies something kind of active. Yeah. Whereas registration implies a surface that's passively receiving traces. Um, in the work of some, like forensic architecture, the forensic aesthetics, it's then. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll try. <laughs> Did you hear any of what I just said? No. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a kind of discrepancy between. You heard Kristen's question, though, via Suhail. <laughs> yeah? OK. <laughs> There's a discrepancy between representation, which might be thought of as a kind of active, um, an act of engagement, or registration, which might be more passive in terms of a surface or a body that receives the inscription of traces. Um, in the sense of forensic aesthetics, for instance, this kind of matter might be interpreted so that kind of, that interpretation, it's an active interpretation that somehow, so maybe interpretation in that sense is wrong, the wrong word. So matter is made to speak by the expert or non-expert who presents it as scientific fact in some cases or as evidence. And this goes back to Michael's question of the distinction. I mean, I know it's different in the history of science, but I'm thinking also about the witnessing Witnessing can be categorized as witnessing without it necessarily being evidence, right? Like the, the, the unreliable witness you were talking about. Whereas, so a witness, of course, interprets what they've experienced and presents it to an audience, but that's definitely not evidence, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So does that answer? So maybe I shouldn't have been using the word interpretation. I think in, in like scientific forums, it would be presented perhaps rather than interpreted. Yeah, there's something really interesting in there. Yeah. Possibly in relation to judgment as well. Yeah. Because the witnessing is often in court of law or something. There's a judgment laid upon the witnesses. Yeah. Like in, in Kristen, like, the, people can't hear you. And yeah, so it's, worry, it's kind worry. of turning into a yeah. private conversation. But down. Um, down here. Let's just check if there are any more questions. Uh, no? Okay. So, oh, well, no, you've already asked one. You can't ask another one. <laughs> you've got to make sure it's a good one at the beginning. Um, all right, so do you have one? Yeah. Okay. I, I had a question about the, the, the local knowledge that you talk about with people in various parts of the world where they're actually um, suffering the, the consequences of, of, of climate change. Um, how, um, 
do you not tap into the, the knowledge, local knowledge of the people there, rather than uh, kind of complicate the, the evidence? Whereas if, if they are claiming that they are affected, is, isn't that evidence enough? Did you, did you hear the question at the back? Yeah, all right. And, and who's the evidence for? Do they have access to the evidence? I think it's, re it's very hard to generalize, you know, talking about local knowledge, well, where, um, but I see where you're coming from. And I think, for instance, in the, the coach, the staged hearing case, the government was putting forward the argument that this river linking project would be beneficial to the economy or to giving people water where perhaps it wasn't before, creating jobs, whatever, like all the usual economic kind of arguments. And the artists are coming in and saying, no, but actually what you haven't taken into account is the cultures that went alongside this natural environment, all the traditional knowledges, the you know various um, traditional practices, so on and so forth. And they were saying, as artists, we can register those things that you in the legal court hasn't taken into consideration because you're working in this kind of extractivist logic. So yes, totally. Um, but the question is, what's the forum? Most of those people wouldn't have been asked in the first place, or it would have been information gathered from without saying, OK, those, that number of people are now have more modern housing, or they have jobs or whatever. They wouldn't even be given the space to testify. So the artist is functioning as a kind of mediator there, saying you're asking the wrong questions, or you're not viewing this in the right way. Yeah. But there again, you've got the, the, art, the art field acting as, a, uh, as an intervening agent yeah. in processes that are happening yeah. elsewhere, and not necessarily for the sake of, sake of the art field itself. Yeah, exactly. Right? So it's, it's yeah. kind of the exhibition point, if, if you want to call it that, or the display point is, di is directed away from the art field. Yeah, yeah. And in many cases, other. it's directed towards the legal sphere, which is why I'm becoming interested in like forms of tribunals and thinking about these kind of fictional spaces as propositional spaces that are a showing the inadequacies of the existing law in the way that a lot of tribunals and people's tribunals do and b proposing things like modes of representation that they think are lacking from the legal sphere yeah. all right it's a good good point to stop thank you Charlotte thank, thank you, you.